Dr. Michael Brown is here. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Amen. <laughs> Good to meet you. Uh, how you doing, sir? Nice to meet you, sir. Doing well, thanks. Oh, man, this is a dream. I have to say that this is a dream, you know, because, uh, yeah, like I was talking, to, I was emailing Dylan, and a part of me was like, I hope the real Dr. Brown shows up. <laughs> Praise God. I honor you, sir. God bless you, sir, for all your work, all your fantastic work you're doing. Well, thank uh, you. We bless you. Thank you, sir. You know, I was just thinking about a passage before you, you came on. Uh, uh, Paul was talking here is uh, 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, let me just go with uh, 14 to 16. It says, I do not write these uh, things to shame you. But as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors uh, in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. When I think about Father, sir, I, the way you write on social media, your, your podcast, Line of Fire, it's just blessing so many people. You are, uh, we just thank you for your heart, just, you know, to just, uh, to the body of Christ, what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your time a lot. It means a lot for being here. Uh, we have uh, ministers on call. We have evangelists. We're on Facebook Live. Uh, we're just excited about what God wants to do today. So before we start, uh, uh, can you just start with prayer, sir? Can you pray before yes, we get into it? Please. Father, we're here to honor you, and as we speak about you and your spirit and your word, Lord, these are sacred things, and we pray for your anointing, we pray for your wisdom, we pray for hearts and minds to be open, we pray that we would not simply speak words, but words that are back with your power, and that are in harmony with your holy word. May Jesus be exalted, may your people be stirred, we ask it in his name, amen. 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 Thank you, sir. God bless you. Uh, for those that don't know you, there might be a person or two or three or five. They don't know who you are, sir. I just felt like it would be, you know, it would be more appropriate if I just, you know, if you just introduce yourself to us. Uh, I mean, people that don't know you here, I mean, I can just speak from, I've been blessed by your ministry. But for those that don't know you, who is a uh, Dog to Michael Brown. Yeah, sure thing. I'm sure there are plenty of folks who don't know me. Uh, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. I got saved in 1971 as a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer. Went to a little gospel preaching church to pull my friends out, and God saved me instead. And as a new believer, my dad was thrilled to see me off drugs, but he said, Michael, we're Jews. We don't believe this. He brought me to meet the local rabbi who challenged me. You don't even know Hebrew. So I started learning Hebrew in college, and that's been Part of what I've done over the years, you know, biblical scholarship and defense of the faith and answering the rabbis. And, and our ministry over the years, as I've been preaching and teaching since 73 and traveled outside of the U.S. So a couple hundred times and then raised at ministry schools that have sent out laborers to the nations. There have been three, three main emphases that we've given ourselves to and that our ministry is involved with every day of every week. Three R's. The first is revival, revival in the church. We burn to see the church come alive. We've seen great awakenings in American history and revivals in other countries. I, I had the privilege of serving as a leader in the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida for four years. Out of that birth to school, out of that birth to missions movement, which continues with laborers all around the world bearing fruit. So revival in the church, your heart beats with that every day. And then revolution, meaning a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution. Not the way the world fights with anger and hatred and violence, but Jesus changing us, and we go in the power of his life and spirit, change the world around us. And then redemption, the redemption of Israel, seeing Jewish people saved. So those are the three R's that burn in us every day. I do a daily live radio broadcast, The Line of Fire, that we, we broadcast on different radio stations, podcasts, and of course on Facebook and YouTube, we do a live stream. And then I write normally about five articles a week dealing with the cultural issues of the day from a biblical perspective, uh, and then travel and, and, and speak and uh, just seek to, to put those three R's in action 
uh, one way or another. Uh, and, and obviously these days in America, especially there's never a dull moment. Uh, you know, so we're, we're really doing our best to serve as a voice of moral culture and spiritual revolution and get people majoring on the majors, what matters most, being re rightly related to God, being disciples and going out and making disciples. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for sharing that. You mentioned uh, the three arrows. The first was revival. For somebody watching right now or live, they don't understand what that term revival is. Can you please help us understand what is revival? Sure. So the word revival itself in English means to make alive again, to revive. So you can't revive a rock because a rock was never alive. And if something is full of life and healthy and vibrant, it doesn't need revival. Being revived means being brought back to life, being brought back to fervor, being brought back to commitment. And years ago when I was teaching on revival, I just wrote out a simple but full definition that, that revival is a season of unusual divine visitation resulting in deep repentance, supernatural renewal, and sweeping reformation in the church, along with the radical conversion of sinners in the world, often producing moral, social, and even economic change in the local or national communities. But it all starts with this concept that revival is a season of unusual divine visitation. Charles Finney said a revival presupposes that the church is sunk down in a backslidden state. And a revival consists in the return of the church from her backslidings and in the conversion of sinners. So revival is the church coming to life again, renewing first love, getting free from sin, free from worldliness, turning away from backsliding, and then as the church is revived, it will naturally reach out and touch the world around it. Wow, so good, so good. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned uh, you were senior leader at Brownsville Revival. For those here that don't, don't know what happened, uh, many have been blessed by people like Donna Kalanda, Eric Gilmore, and uh, you know the list goes on. What happened at Brownsville Revival? I mean, yeah, if you could just walk us through briefly. Yeah, sure, season. sure thing. It's important to understand for people who weren't there, if you go search online, you'll read amazing testimonies, incredible stories, things that'll bring you to tears. And then you'll read, it was not of God, it was heretical. And that almost always happens when you have revival movements. As I've said for decades, that you can have controversy without revival but you cannot have revival without controversy. Arthur Wallace, who was a British Bible teacher in the book, In the Day of Thy Power, said that if something claims to be a revival and it's not spoken against, check again to see whether it's really a revival because revival is going to upset the apple cart. It, it, it's going to push back against the status quo and God's going to move in power and it will always have critics. So the Brownsville revival began Father's Day of 1995 in Pensacola, Florida. The reason it's called Brownsville is a little neighborhood, a, a poor neighborhood within Pensacola, Florida. It doesn't have its own zip code, its own post office, just it's, it's part of Pensacola, right? And uh, there's an Assembly of God church that had been there for years, and it was a successful church, maybe had 1,500 members or something like that. Uh, but the pastor, John Kilpatrick, was desperate for more. He knew reading scripture. He knew relating to God. He knew reading about past revivals. There had to be more. So he began to seek God earnestly. He would go into the building in the middle of the night in the pitch dark and just get on his face and groan and cry out, God, there's got to be more. So he came to his church staff about two years before revival started and said, I don't know what I'm doing, except I got to do it. We're canceling Sunday night services, which was a big preaching service there in the South. And we're just turning it into a prayer meeting. And we're just going to pray every Sunday night. So they prayed for two years before revival came. And then uh, he was really at a place of absolute spiritual desperation. And an evangelist named Steve Hill that the church had supported for years when he was on the mission field, and a man that had become a friend of mine through our mutual friendship with Leonard Ravenhill, great champion of revival, great man of prayer, wrote classic books like Why Revival Tarries and Revival Praying, that you read Why, Why, Why Revival Tarries, today, it'll shake you. <laughs> it'll shake you up. So Steve and I knew each other through Leonard Ravenhill, 
Steve was uh, scheduled to speak there on a Sunday night before prayer meeting, and John Kilpatrick asked him to take the Sunday morning service on Father's Day. Pastor Kilpatrick was really struggling. His mom had died a few weeks earlier. Some of the key members of his church had just left. He was really hurting. He wasn't up to preaching that morning. Steve Hill got up and preached, and Steve himself had been freshly touched by an outpouring of the Spirit. He called me and just told me the power of God is falling as he's ministering, and people are getting saved in amazing ways. So he brought a message. If, if you watch the message from that day, it's like, huh? doesn't seem like much. He, he gives an altar call afterwards, and a couple people come up, not much. And then he says, you want a fresh touch from God? Stand up, I want to pray for you. And that's when the power of God fell. And that's when the power of God fell upon John Kilpatrick. And, and he was just laid out in the presence of God for hours, which never, ever happened to him. That night at prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit was there in a powerful way. And so why don't we go another night? Why don't we go another night? It ended up being about five years of another night. And uh, God called me to be part of the leadership there. Steve invited me to visit. As soon as I got there, God joined all of our hearts together. But you're talking about something where, without advertising, people came from over 130 nations to be in the meetings. We're talking about the lines would form at 6 in the morning for the doors to open at 6 in the evening, for the service to start at 7 in the evening, to then go till midnight, 1 in the morning. Tuesday night would be prayer meeting, then services Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. This went on for years. We know firsthand testimonies of, of, for example, a woman driving by the building without any thought of God. Suddenly, conviction falls in her car. She begins weeping in her car and gets born again as she drives by the building. We find out because she becomes a member of the church later on. We're talking about crazy stories that you, you hardly believe. For example, two Playboy bunnies were down in Pensacola. They were, they were getting ready for a photo shoot on the beach. And the hurricane weather came in, the photo shoot was canceled. So they just call a taxi, they get in the taxi, they say, hey, where's the action in Pensacola? The taxi driver brings them over to the church. They figure, well, just go in like on a lark. And there they are at the end of the night, weeping at the altar. And John Kilpatrick just noticed they seemed you know, weeping and shaking. So he just went over to find out what's going on, only to find out their, their story. We haven't been lived the best lives. I, I, I'm talking about a year and a half into the revival, I sat down with the local superintendent of schools and I asked him, I said, has the revival impacted the schools? And he said, oh, I can tell you firsthand the high schools. I was principal of one. I can tell you what happened in the schools. And just give you a little glimpse, Richard Crisco was the youth pastor and the youth group jumped suddenly from like 100 to 500 and, and kids who are burning bright for Jesus to this day were touched back then. And the revival began in June so September of that year, uh, the, the school year starts, and there's an event called See You at the Pole that happens in many cities where the kids come, and the first day of school or the first Wednesday, they gather around a flagpole outside the building, and they pray. So Richard had kids on all the different schools in, in the county, and he got a count of how many were there at all the different, you know, from all the different churches and things, praying that September of 95, it was 300 kids. September of 96, it was 2,000 kids. So this is the way God was moving in that community. And then people would come from around the world, and these were the stories that we loved. They, they'd come from around the world, God would touch them, they'd go back to their church and the fire would fall. Repentance would break out. Uh, you know, one, one group of pastors came down from Virginia Beach and so this is within the States. They came down from Virginia Beach. They were touched in the meetings, but it wasn't until they left driving home that the Holy Spirit fell in their car. They began to wail in intercession. This is on a Saturday. Pastor gets up on a Sunday, preaches repentance, and says, if you've got porn, if you've got drugs, if you've got alcohol, you need to bring this altar. Well, it's Sunday morning. Who's traveling with porn and alcohol? Well, people go running to their cars, and they come in and start piling stuff at the altar. That began a move there that lasted for years. Uh, I, I preached at a church in New Jersey, and the pastor said, you have to hear our story. They had been having an outpouring of the Spirit that had been going on for two years when I got there. And you could tell when you preached, the Spirit, was, it, it, was, it was alive. God was moving. They said, you have to hear our story. They said five of us came down as pastors to visit the revival. They said, we were in the services. We responded to the altar calls. It was good. We were blessed. But we left 
thinking, it's got to be more. They were disappointed. We were expecting more. Well, they get on the plane, and Pensacola is a regional airport. It's a small airport, so you can't fly there directly unless you're really close in the area. So, for example, if you fly in Delta, you have to go by way of Atlanta. If, if you're on American Airlines, you have to go by way of Charlotte. They're just limited options. So there's a really short flight on Delta from Pensacola to Atlanta. I mean, you're in the air less than a half an hour. Well, they go to get on the flight, and they look at their tickets like, what happened? We had five seats right across, one, two, three, four, five. All five of them separated on the plane. Well, the pastor, to his shock, as they're flying, the Holy Spirit falls in him, not in the church, not at the altar calls, not we're laying hands on people. On the plane, the Spirit falls in him. He begins to weep and encounters God in a life-changing way. He can't wait to tell the other guys what happened, only to find out all five were touched in the identical way, all separate in different parts of the plane. They went from there to the church, and that's when the outpouring began. So you're just talking about a supernatural thing that God did. And, and the fruit that's come out of it has been people's lives touched around the world. Right now, our own missions organization has about 150 people serving all around the world. Some of them have been on the field over 20 years. Many of them dramatically touched in the revival. That's what set them ablaze. They left everything and now they're serving all around the world. So, I mean, the problem is I could go on for about 100 years telling stories. But that this paints a picture. That gives a glimpse. And the encounter with Jesus, night in, night out, man, that was everything. So good. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. Thank you, sir. I've always had a question about revival. Uh, I know Catch the Fire. I live in, we live in uh, Toronto, Canada. Catch the Fire also had a revival in 94, the Toronto Blessing. I've always had this question. What stops revival? Yeah. So the, the Toronto blessing under the Arnots, that did continue for, for quite a number of years. And, and of course, much good fruit came out of the Hottie Baker dramatically touched, you know, in her amazing ministry with her husband in Mozambique and things like that. Uh, I, I had never been to Toronto during those days and, and finally spoke at the church there just a couple of years ago for a, a conference with Dan Kalenda. And you mentioned Dan, Eric, these were students of ours in our school of ministry now bearing amazing fruit. But there are a few things. Number one, revival by its nature it is not meant to be sustained long term. It, it is so intense. It has a certain purpose, which is just look at it like this. If, if the church is supposed to be here and falls back here, you need this jolt to get it back. So it, it's, I look at it like this, that you're in a building, you've got to get up to the hundredth floor. The stairs are broken down. There's no way you can do it. The elevator only works every so often. When it works, you get on it and you get onto the hundredth floor, but then you get off it and do your business. So the purpose of revival is to get us back to where we need it to be. And it comes with a certain intensity, which by its very nature cannot be sustained long-term. I remember early in the revival, David Wilkerson telling me when we raised up a school, he said, hey, that's the best thing you could do because the life of a revival is going to be four or five years max. And I thought, no, no, this could just go on forever. So what you want to have is a, is a revived people, a people who are keeping the fire burning, who are living by godly principles, who are bearing fruit. So a revival culture, you would say, but revival in itself comes with such intensity that you just get worn out. So why does it stop human weariness? you know, my own schedule, and, and I took on extra things, it's kind of my nature, but my own schedule was ministry related activities would be 80 to 100 hours a week. And, and it's glorious, it's, it's unbelievable, but you wear out after a period of time, you get tired. Um, and, and then other things can happen. Maybe you, you lean on the arm of the flesh. Maybe the thing becomes your thing. Uh, you know, there's so many things that can get in the way. And I've written on things that hinder revival. In fact, Charles Finney in his revival lectures has one chapter, one of his sermons about 30 things that hinder revival. And it's, it's really quite remarkable. I, I drew up my own list of 20 and then looked at his and said, wow, I, we're almost identical on most of them. So the same kinds of principles, if someone tries to own it, uh, anything like that. But a lot of it is, is human weariness. And then God is determined to get all the glory. 
And I know one thing for me in revival is, is God showed me flesh in my own life. God, God, the fire fell on me also. And it, it ended up being a great time of, of personal purging and purifying. And then look, the devil is active and, and he wants to destroy and he wants to hurt. And at the end of the revival, there was a, a painful split between the pastor, John Kilpatrick, and me. So a, a split in, in many ways between the church and school. And we're all reconciled. We're friends. I honor him, esteem him. I've preached for him. Uh, but, you know, the enemy got in. And, and I remember when we talked about it a couple of years later, you know, saying, hey, our relationship was good. I remember him saying that, you know, he said, but just as much as you experienced the glory of God in ways you never did, you experienced satanic attack in ways you never did. And we just thought, you know, as we were weary and, you know, worn down, the enemy was able to, to get in. But I'll tell you this, when God moves, you have to cherish it. You have to seize the moment. Uh, Steve Hill popularized the saying of Leonard Ravenhill, something Len had shared with him shortly before he died, saying the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. And, and I had been praying for years and fasting and crying out for years for revival. And when God moved, I thought, this you got to just jump in with both feet. Steve canceled all of his preaching around the world for years just to pour himself in there. So when God moves, you seize the moment because you don't know it's going to last a day, a week, a month, a year. And, and every time you get into the meeting and God's moving, you're just blessed. You know, every, every week as the services would start again, and then new crowds would come and the Holy Spirit would be there. He's just like, thank you, Jesus. You're just you're always grateful, always overwhelmed. Wow. And I'll tell you this, uh, you read stories about revival, history of revival. You think, is it really like that? Yes, it is. It's everything it's cracked up to be. There's humanity, there's flesh, there's error, there's things you could do better. You know, there are people backslide. Yeah, humanity continues. But in terms of the presence, the glory, the transformation, the power, the change lives, the things that just bring you on your face, weeping before God. It's all it's cracked up to be. Wow. So good. So good. Thank you. With all that you've seen, you know, being saved after, uh, before you were saved, you went to drugs and God saved you. With all that you've seen with revival, how would you describe, who's Jesus? Someone watching right now, how would you describe Jesus to them? So he is the most wonderful, amazing, glorious being person you could ever imagine. His goodness, his kindness, his mercy, his purity, so transcend anything that we could think that if he was physically in the room with us and just gazed in our eyes, we would, we would melt in every respect. He is the exact representation of God himself carrying the divine nature, but he is the express image of God. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. If, if, if people say, what is, what is God like? Look at Jesus. Listen to Jesus with his, with his perfect holiness that is unreachable for us, with his perfect mercy that says, I will take your place and bridge the gap, with him not caring about human status there's no respect of persons. You can't impress him. You, you can't do something where he says, well, you're so rich or you're so famous or you're so smart because any good thing we have is given from him and our riches and honor compared to heaven is, is nothing. But you think, of, you think of him existing eternally with his heavenly father in, in, the, in the glory of heaven and beyond anything we can imagine. And then he comes down into this earth as a human being. We... we we can't imagine what that's like. He comes down here as a human being and then dies for us so that we can, we can know God. And not only that, we can become like him and be changed. He's utterly, absolutely amazing beyond description. And when there's true revival, he's central. When people are lifted up, when denominations are lifted up, when doctrines are lifted up, something's missing. When God's really moving, he's going to draw attention to his son, and then that in turn will draw attention to the Heavenly Father. Okay. Okay. You wrote, you've written many books, many books, and one of the books you wrote was a Stand with Israel. I wanted to ask you, uh, why is it important for Christians to stand with Israel? Yes, yeah, so there, there are a few books I've written 
not with that specific title, but our, our hands are stained with blood, the tragic story of the church and the Jewish people, which really lays out church history and then God's heart for Israel. And just uh, from last month, Christian anti-Semitism uh, confronting the lies in today's church. And yes, that has been a message in terms of the importance of standing with Israel. So, so there are a, a few things. One is we recognize that Satan's tried to wipe out the Jewish people. Yes, we know there's been divine judgment and scattering on, on Israel, but we know that Satan has tried to wipe out the Jewish people. So we are standing against Satan by standing with the Jewish people. More importantly, we realize that God himself has promised to preserve Israel and the Jewish people no matter what. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37, God makes that plain that no matter what Israel does, he'll still preserve us as a people. I say us as a Jewish believer myself. So he who scattered us around the world is the one who kept us and the one who regathered us, even under judgment. So we are standing against the devil when we stand with Israel. We are standing with God who has regathered the Jewish people. Yes, even in unbelief, even in sin, but we recognize God has done it. That's the second thing. A third thing is that it is, it is our connection to roots in that Moses, the prophets, were the people of Israel, and Jesus himself, Jewish, all the apostles, Jewish. God chose Israel to be a light of the world, which is another reason that Satan hates Israel. So it is as part of a debt of love to say salvation came from Israel. We want to repay that debt by being a blessing. A fourth reason would be that the word says that those who bless Abraham's seed, speaking about the people of Israel, that God will bless. So again, it's for those previous reasons, but there is that blessing that comes. And then a fifth reason would be this, that through church history, the church has often gotten things with Israel very, very wrong. You know, in America, the slogan of our last president, President Trump, was make America great again. And, you know, the discussion we'd always have with our black Christian friends is like that one, means one thing to white Americans, another thing to black Americans. You know, when was America great for the slaves? When was America great under segregation? When was America great for the Native American population? So just like the church was very hypocritical and committed ugly sins against Africans, but did it in Jesus' name. You know, they were inferior, or they were under a curse. Well, the church has committed great sins against the Jewish people in history and has persecuted them and has driven them out. You know, all non-baptized Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492. Uh, Martin Luther, who started with a gracious outreach to the Jewish people, turned uh, to an ugly anti-Semite later in his life. Uh, Adolf Hitler reprinted the, the writings of Martin Luther to, to stir further anti-Semitism. So it's a public way of repenting. It's a public way of saying, hey, we got this very wrong. And, and let us show you what a real Christian is like. As I've preached around the world and shared about church history and persecution of Jews, Christians are shocked. They're shocked in India. They're shocked in Africa. They're, they're shocked in, in, in Japan or, or in, in South Korea or in other countries where I've shared this. They've never heard of it. They can't imagine it. I remember an Iranian Christian in my home saying to me, you cannot love Jesus and hate the Jews. And yet your average Jew thinks of Christians as, as hateful. Your average Jew thinks of church history as very, very ugly, a straight line from, or traditional Jew thinks of a straight line from, from Jesus in the New Testament to the Holocaust. So this is a way of demonstrating true Christian love. And then lastly, uh, Israel is a democracy in the Middle East, and it's, it's a good and right thing to stand with them. Even though Israel is far from a perfect nation, it really does strive to do right in many ways. And therefore, just uh, on a righteousness and political level, we should stand with them. So that's... Uh, that's a lengthy answer for a short question. Oh, so good. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to go to another. You mentioned uh, Donald Trump. I believe you wrote a book called Donald Trump is not the Messiah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Do Donald Trump is not my savior. It's not your savior. Yes, that's yeah. the title of the book. Now, another book you wrote was Revolution in the Church, right? Uh, with all that's going on today, I mean, I'm just going to ask you three questions or one. I mean, speaking to so many Christian friends and Donald Trump not winning, you know, and all the prophets said certain things and didn't happen. So many confusions there. And then we look at uh, what happened with uh, uh, Rabbi Zechariah. 
and all of that. Uh, what kind of revolution do you think the church needs right now? Because there seems to be a lot of shaking going on. Yes. So let me first say when I wrote Revolution in the Church, which was almost 20 years ago, I, I was focusing there on the structure of church, going to church more than being the church, the clergy laity distinction rather than mobilizing a body. Uh, so having a different outlook on what it means to, to do church and be church uh, from that respect. So that still remains. I have, I have dear friends who are in house church movement and absolutely commit, totally committed to the house churches. And I have good friends who are mega church pastors. And I've been in both environments, house church and mega church, and found healthy Christians in both. So God can move in many, many different ways. But our spectator Christianity are showing up for a performance, for a service, that's not going to change the world. Audiences are not going to change the world. We have to look at ourselves as being equipped to go out. So the purpose of leaders is to equip the body to go out and do the work of ministry. So that remains a major need, especially in America, where we are build it bigger and better. That's what we're about. Whatever it is, we can do it bigger and better. And Jesus, in fact, comes to give you a bigger and better life. That's, that's the American perversion of the gospel, as opposed to deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. So we need a fundamental understanding and paradigm shift in terms of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what it means to be the church. Beyond that, yeah, there are some major, major concerns. Uh, I voted for Donald Trump twice, primarily because it was Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. And I have grave, grave differences with much of the Democratic platform, starting with abortion. So those were grave, grave things to me. At the same time, I was always concerned about the politicizing of the church, always concerned about the church putting its trust in a very, very flawed man who, for all the good he did, did a tremendous amount of damage as well. And therefore, I wanted to shout out to the world, yes, I voted for him and support his policies, but he is not my savior, and we must not confuse the kingdom of God with a political party. Uh, sometimes my black evangelical friends are very much Democrat, white evangelical friends, Republican. The kingdom of God is not Republican or Democrat. The, the kingdom of God cuts through all of that and challenges all sides. So we have, in America, gotten a very, very unhealthy politicizing uh, we have been so caught up with politics and some sadly so caught up with Trump really in an idolatrous way that it's, it's terribly unhealthy. We become nasty and mean spirited and angry and we, we divide over political issues as opposed to uniting around Jesus. So we, we need really deep, deep repentance there. Those that, that put their hope in Trump, meaning not that they mistook him for God, not that they mistook him for Jesus, but rather the mentality that if Trump's not reelected, the church is doomed. That's crazy. That's, that's idolatrous. N not, not only completely false, but it's idolatrous as if some very flawed man is going to be the one to save the church. Jesus saves the church, and he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we've really got to reevaluate there. And I believe, although there's some fine prophetic people that love Jesus and that just were mistaken here, uh, I believe many got caught up in a partisan political spirit. And, and because of that, it has brought something very ugly in the church. And the moment I begin to address it, it's amazing the level of ugliness and hatred and anger that comes like, okay, something is very wrong with that spirit. Uh, the last thing has to do with the scandals that you mentioned. You know, they're so widespread. I'm not going to start listing names, but a, a wide variety of major well-known Christian leaders in America from a bunch of different camps, all caught in one scandal or another, some of, of worse proportions, like Ravi sadly of, of massive proportion with so many victims. Um, and, and then you got the prophets getting things wrong and then the politicizing of the church. So I don't look at this and throw stones. First thing I would search my own heart, search how I'm living. But then you realize we got to get low here. Somehow, Evangelicals getting close to Trump, and I, I know some of these men personally, they're men of God, and they really tried to speak into his life. And they said, they've said to me, Michael, you see the good decisions he made? That's because we were in his ear, pushing and encouraging and urging him to do that. But somehow we got so identified with a man 
that especially in America, evangelicals are looked at as the Trump people as opposed to the Jesus people. I mean, it's, it's very, very ugly and, and grievous, I believe, in God's sight. But, but what, what happened is that, that we have just gotten so carnal in so many other ways that we've lost our way. And, and to me, if we had four more years of Trump, and remember, I voted for him a few months ago, but if we had four more years of Trump, I believe that that would have brought this attitude of triumphalism. We can do, we're going to ta take over, we're going to push our laws on people and all. I, I believe it would have been driven people even further from the gospel and, and done even more harm to the church. So the good news is God is moving. Hearts are being stirred. Uh, I, I saw it before COVID. And then before we got caught up with the election fever, you know, with all the, the, the racial tension and unrest and COVID and so much shaking, I saw a lot of people crying out. I have colleagues that were on the streets in some of the hottest areas in America, I mean, with protests and riots, and they were preaching Jesus and even had like portable baptismal pools because so many people were getting saved. So the good news is we're a mess. And if we'll recognize it and get low, if we, it, it, I'm probably going to write an article on this soon, it's high time for the church to get very low. If we'll do that, God will hear our cry. And I believe he wants to pour out his spirit all over America not just in one church or two, but all over America and where he finds hunger and thirst, I believe we're going to see amazing outpouring. Come on. Come on. So good. There's been a lot of Christian organization that we've seen a lot of compromises. I read an article of yours recently that was actually, I was shocked. Uh, I'm just going to read uh, a paragraph it says to the leader to the leadership of Bethany Christian Services, I make this heartfelt appeal as a fellow disciple of Jesus who also cares about the well-being of needy children. Please reconsider the decision to provide services for gay and lesbian couples who wanting to adopt. Please ask yourselves again, is this decision honoring to the Lord in whose name you work? We're seeing things like this more often. Uh, what advice do you have for, there might be a person watching right now and they're on that verge of compromising on your faith, maybe because you've lost a business or you need funds for your charity organization. What do you have to say to such a person or organization? Jesus said, if you save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for my sake in the gospel, you'll find it. What you must do is say, I live to do the will of God. I am not a slave to human opinion. I'm not a slave to finances. I'm not a slave to popularity. I'm a slave to the will of God. If you will comfort, well, if I don't say this, if I don't do this, if I play a little differently, if I avoid this, I'll get the promotion on my job. I'll get that scholarship in my school. I'll, I, I won't lose my pension. Uh, the people won't leave my church. I, you're a slave. Uh, Martin Luther King said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is true. So something inside you dies, your integrity, your conviction. You, you become less uh, and you lose your life. When you say, Lord, I'm going to obey you. I'm not going to be a troublemaker. I'm not going to be mean-spirited, angry. I'll use wisdom. But Lord, I'm going to obey you regardless of what happens. So you die to your life and now you find, now you're free. Now you're free. So to everyone that's facing this choice, you're going to stand before God one day. How will your excuse look in the sight of a holy, almighty God who promised to be with you? How will your excuse look in the eyes of Jesus who shed his blood so you could belong to him? And how will that excuse look in, in light of eternal glory before you. Uh, I, I did an interview earlier that'll air in New Zealand and their most famous uh, footballer, Israel Falau, you know, record setting and all of that. Uh, he was known as a devout Christian. Someone asked him a view on, on social media about homosexual practice and he just posted, the Bible says this, you know, and he listed, if you live like this, like this, like this, you, you'll be judged, you'll perish. And because of that, he lost his career. And he's not, he's not crying over it. He's, he started with another league in another, another country. Uh, but he understands that all the accolades of man, they only go so far. 
And, and Paul said, if I yet please men, in Galatians 1, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Here, let, let's think of an example from Canada. You have a little-known psychology professor, clinical psychology, Jordan Peterson at the University of Toronto. He spends 13 years, three hours a day, working on a book called Maps of Meaning. It comes out in 1999. How many people bought the book? How many people knew him? Yeah, he had lectured at Harvard, you know, respected God, but never heard of him. Well, then Canada changes its, its laws, and now it's going to enforce speech. And, and it's not a matter of being rude to someone who identifies as transgender, but if I genuinely believe that you are Joe and not Jane, I, I can't be compelled to call you Jane. Or if you say, I want to be referred to as they when you're a single person, well, I, I can't do that. And Jordan Peterson, for decades, had studied totalitarian regimes and communism, socialism. So the moment he saw this enforced speech thing, he said, no. So he begins to post YouTube videos. He's on TV and he says, well, I'm not going to comply. If they put me in jail, I'll go on a hunger strike, but I'm not going to comply. Well, next thing, he becomes the best-selling author of Rules for Life, sold over 5 million copies. He's spoken to over a quarter of a million people in his book tours. He's been called the most influential public intellectual of today. So he says, I'm not going to bow down. His school said, well, we're not going to stand with you. If lawsuits come and get, we're not going to stand with you. And I had him on the radio right before he became famous. So I just thought he's a Christian professor, this poor guy getting attacked and beleaguered. And I don't even know where he is in his Christian faith. I mean, he honors scripture, but I don't know if he's, he's truly a Christian yet. Instead of him being some beleaguered guy, he was like bold and, and no pity party or anything like that. Now, it doesn't always work like that. Somebody else, what happens is your head gets chopped off, you know? But we're not living for self. We're living to do the will of God and to please God. In 2004, God began to burden me about gay, lesbian activism. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. why me? I, I don't come out of homosexuality. It's not my lifestyle, nothing that I ever struggled with. I don't have a particular burden to reach those who identify as gay. I don't have training. My PhD is in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University. I don't, I'm not a psychologist or therapist or why me? And what I understood was, no, no one gets to sit this one out. This is going to be the great moral challenge of this generation. Because look, we want to be loving. We want to be kind. We don't want to discriminate. We want to welcome everybody. But God made us certain ways and there's certain standards. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me late 2004, early 2005, reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion, resist the agenda with courage. Those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. We need hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. So this is the great issue of the day. And look, you just have to make a choice. I'm going to honor God. And, and let, me, let me ask you this. When you read about, say, our Christian brothers and sisters in Nigeria, literally having their heads chopped off for the gospel, I've been to India 27 times. One of my dearest friends in the world is on the front lines there. I would say at least five of the people we laid hands on and sent out over the years have been martyred for their faith. And they just go. I, I, I was speaking to a few hundred Indian pastors and church planters, you know, all Indian, on one of my trips. And I said, how many of you have been physically attacked for the gospel? Not verbally attacked, physically attacked. And I would say about three quarters raised their hands. But they raised their hands as if I'd said, did you have breakfast today? It's like, yeah. And <laughs> that's normal. When, when my friend baptizes people when I'm there with him in India, he asks them, are you willing to follow Jesus to your last drop of blood, to your last breath? This is at water baptism. And they nod, yes, yes, I'm willing. Then he baptizes them. So we, we just need to look in the mirror a little bit and say, I'm not a wimp. I'm not a baby. I'm an overcomer in Jesus. And I'm going to do what's right. And Lord, if that's your plan for me, if your plan is that I glorify you by losing everything, so be it. If your plan is I glorify you by dying, so be it. If your plan is that I glorify you by becoming the best known person on the planet, whatever you want, I'm here to do your will. And you cross that line privately in prayer. You lay everything down. It's a real death. You lay everything down and then you find freedom. And then you live it out, sharing the gospel. You live it out standing for what's right. You don't try to make trouble. You walk in love towards all. But when you have to stand, stand. If you don't, you lose your life. Wow. Wow. That's intense.
Dr. Michael Brown, is it okay if uh, a person or two ask you a question from this call? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Absolutely, my brother. Thank you, sir. There, there's actually, you just spoke about Nigeria. I'm originally from Nigeria. Mm. Uh, my dad pastors in Nigeria, a large church, and uh, stories of Boko Haram and, uh, and the herdsmen are true. Uh, yes. One of my dad's church had an explosion several years ago. So, you know, the Fulani so herdsmen. Yeah. And, and yes, the government yes. doing nothing about it. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's really, really, uh, it, it's, it's crazy what's happening there, but we're believing for a move of God. Amen. I actually have a friend right now who's living in Nigeria right now. Uh, he's visiting there for a few months. He's, uh, and I believe, Chimer, you have a question for Dr. Michael Brown. Um, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Brown, for joining. Uh, it's been really a, a pleasure uh, just listening to you and following you over the years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be at IHOP, uh, Casey, a couple of years ago when you spoke over there, and also okay. uh, in Toronto, uh, Catch the Fire Church as well. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I do have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, the first one uh, really is around uh, kind of like the prophetic. Um, so, uh, so basically, I know you talked a little bit about, you know, how some of the prophets got it wrong during the whole uh, elections and, you know, things like that. Um, what 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 is your view about uh, current day prophets? Um, if you look at like the Old Testament, you know, biblical uh, prophets uh, do, during those uh, dispensation, you could clearly know uh, that the the prophet was handpicked and anointed by God, and the people recognized the office of the prophet. Uh, you know, because they saw God's hand and they saw the uh, anointing uh, on the prophet. Uh, it was almost uh, kind of beyond a religious office. It was almost political, if you will, because the king uh, took counsel directly from, you know, the prophet because they knew that he or she, or well, you know, he was the uh, mouthpiece uh, of the Lord. Um, how would you, you know, how do you see modern day prophets in today's uh, dispensation, you know, given the fact that there isn't really that clear uh, uh, office in terms of where, you know, this is a person that is anointed, you know, by God to carry uh, or to occupy that office. So that's my first question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I do believe they're prophets today, just like they're pastors and teachers and evangelists and those called to apostolic ministry. And they are, they're not just isolated and independent as Old Testament prophets would have been. And because the Holy Spirit indwells all of us and all of us can potentially prophesy there is a leveling out of things. The prophet does not stand out the same way. And that's a big mistake that we've made, exalting the prophet in the special role. And, and even looking to them to just be telling us what's coming next in the future. I, I don't see prophets as, especially in the New Testament, as primarily spiritual fortune tellers or things like that. But just like you can see someone has a teaching gift, well, that, that per, man, they just love to open the word. And it's like, well, we got lost people that need to hear the gospel. Yeah, yeah, but let's get in the word first. You know, that's, that's just what they think. And others are really shepherds. I mean, they're, they live and breathe with the well being of the flock, the church is hurting. And, and others are evangelists, like, but we got, lost, we got lost people to reach. Like Dan Kalenda's joke, you know, and others have said that uh, hell for an evangelist is a big crowd that everybody is saved, and heaven is a big crowd and everybody's lost. Those who are prophetic, they're, they're going to be recognized too because there's a certain fire that burns in them for the glory of God and for holiness. And, and they're going to be preaching repentance. They're not just going to have revelation and insight and wisdom, but the focus is ultimately going to be the testimony of Jesus. There will be supernatural aspects of knowing things that others don't know or seeing what's coming in ways that others don't. So that's, you know, you, you begin to say, okay, that person's prophetic. They they keep warning about this, you know, this danger here, a problem here, and it's true and it's real. Or this, like, pastor, something's wrong here. Something's it's funny. There's sin in the camp. And you pray deeper, and it becomes revealed. You look in Revelation two and three, and you see the the prophetic ministry there. Jesus speaking by the Spirit to the churches, and five out of the seven called to repent or else. So I see prophetic ministry primarily in those ways, pointing us to Jesus, fixing what's wrong in the church, calling for repentance. And then with supernatural backing, uh, and I, I think one of the big errors that we got into was looking at prophets, when, when's COVID going to end and who's going to be the next president? I don't see that as a primary New Testament function. But like any other ministry gift, it, it's recognized by, by doing what it does uniquely. And as we make room for that, then it really helps. Like, okay, that's, that's God's wired you that way. 
That's your calling. That's how you see things. So let's get you balanced out with others around you, but then also free to run your race. The same with all the other aspects of, of ministry today. Your second question. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, that, was, that was good. Um, so my second question um, is around Israel. So I know earlier on Solomon had asked you, uh, you know, like why should Christians or why should the church care about Israel? And you very eloquently uh, explained, you know, some of that reasoning. Um, I came across an article uh, a few, I think a few, uh, few weeks ago, where it talks about, you know, can uh, Israel become an idol? You know, can the love for Israel become an idol? Uh, you know, in the Christian, uh, in the Christian space. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I know that you also, you know, posted that article uh, on your, on your page. Um, so I just wanted to get, you know, some of your thoughts around you yeah. know, how the love for yeah. Israel and the love for the Jewish people can then become, you know, an idol uh, in the lives of, uh, of believers. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. uh, that was, that was an article from the Israel Today magazine and we'll post an article from them each week that's normally exclusive to them, but our readers get to, to read it. And then they'll post something of mine in, in their magazine. So these, this is an article from Israel, pro-Israel. But yeah, Israel can become an idol. One way is the sentimental affection and love for Israel, where you forget that Jewish people need Jesus, where you are a Christian Zionist to the point that you don't even share the gospel. And we've seen this as a real, real problem, that it's almost an over-repentance for the years of anti-Semitism that swings the other way, that, uh, that you can't even share the gospel. An another is over-exaltation of the Jewish people, failing to realize the faults, the blemishes, the weakness. Again, you swing from one thing where Jews are all demons and the worst scum of the earth, and you swing the other way where Jews are like the most amazing, perfect people. And neither, neither view is, is true, of course. But that can happen. Uh, and, and then a third thing is that we become so Israel-centric. Everything's about Israel, what's happening in Israel, the prophecy being fulfilled in Israel, latest developments in Israel, that that becomes our primary focus instead of the Lord being our primary focus. So I would say those are some of the principal ways that, that we could look to Israel in an idolatrous way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Chimere. Thank you, Chimere. Uh, Tiago, are you, do you have time for another question? Yeah, yeah, I've got a couple more minutes. Yep. Okay, so we got two questions left. Uh, and I'm gonna ask, uh, Tiago, are you here right now? Tiago isn't here. Okay, so uh, my next question for you is, uh, my next question for you, can a gay be, uh, a, so recently we had a situation uh, with the whole LGBT is very sensitive. We've had pastors, we've had uh, evangelists in the city uh, being arrested for just, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. So my question for you is, uh, biblically, I mean, we've seen situations whereby uh, gays are in worship teams in churches. What comments do you have to say about like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm asking the question right, but what questions do you have to say for a church who uh, uses the word of like, they, they, they justify having a gay person on worship team as to say you have to love on your neighbor. Right, so number one, can you practice homosexuality and follow Jesus at the same time? No, of course not. Absolutely categorically not. You cannot be in a same sex relationship romantically, sexually affirming it and follow Jesus at the same time. It's not possible. Uh, one ex-gay Christian was asked, can you be gay and Christian? He said, not for long. <laughs> In other words, if you genuinely get saved, you'll have to make a break with that. Can you follow Jesus and struggle with same-sex attraction? Of course. You're just like you may be a single man and, and you have to watch your eyes and you meet a young lady and immediately you're thinking about having sex with her. Well, that's, that's wrong. That's sin. And you say no to it and, and you turn to the Lord and, and you don't justify it. You don't live a life of secret pornography or something like that. Well, everyone struggles with something one way or another, pride, self-righteousness, prayerlessness, lack of compassion, lust, whatever. So someone that's same-sex attracted, that, that's a very strong area in their lives, but they can say no to it and honor the Lord. And I know ex-gays who are celibate, 
they have subdued their same sex desires. In other words, they're, they're not committing sexual sin, uh, but they're not attracted to the opposite sex. So they live celibate lives and they're blessed. I know others that got instantly delivered. God worked a miracle in their lives. I know them personally. And something happened to them and they've been happily married to the opposite sex ever since. And then I know others that over years of counseling and prayer have seen a lessening of those same sex attractions to the point that they're now uh, attracted to the opposite sex on some level. But the bottom line is the practice, the lifestyle. Scripture is explicit on it. My book, Can You Be Gay and Christian, gets into this. Uh, if all we had was the Bible, no one ever would have questioned this. The reason it's being questioned is because of political pressure, because of cultural pressure. No one ever would have wondered for a split second what the Bible says. Not just that it always, in the, the few times it references it, always opposes homosexual practice, but because it only gives one model, which is heterosexual. Honor your father and your mother. Husband, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's the only model that there is. Every parable about weddings, every teaching about weddings and marriage, and it all presupposes heterosexuality because that's God's design. The two become one, man and woman, because the woman comes out of man and now reunites. We are made uniquely biologically and emotionally. There's a complementarity that only exists between male and female. So if someone says, no, no, the people on our worship team, they're living godly lives. They're not affirming homosexual practice. They're not in a gay relationship. Well, then don't call them gay. That's a cultural marker. That's right. Ident- don't say this person is a gay Christian. Uh, any more than you would say this person is a gossiping Christian or an adulterous Christian. You, you don't put something in front of it. And, and it, it hurts the person themselves. Even if they mean well, they're trying to be humble or reach out to others. No, you're a child of, if you're born again, let me go. If you're a child of God, you're a son or daughter of God. That's who you are. That's your identity. And yeah, maybe you struggle with same-sex attraction. Maybe someone else struggles with hatred. Someone else struggles with violence. Someone else struggles, okay. We're flawed human beings. That's why we have a redeemer, a savior who changes us. But this is just the way of compromise where, where God is moving around the world powerfully and people are coming to the Lord in large numbers. They will understand this homosexual practice of sin and the churches are strong on it and teach it and preach it. Where there's compromise, so-called progressive Christianity, uh, adopting the Bible to make it fit the culture of the day, those are the ones that aren't seeing the power of God. Those are the ones that are losing members. Uh, and, and what's happening in North America and Europe is as the church gets more and more compromised, the, the church ceases to be the church and dies. And this is one of the greatest evidences of it. Where God's really moving around the world, it's the exact opposite. The word of God is reinforced. So we recognize that often as Christians, we have made those who identify as gay, lesbian, feel like the worst of sinners. We have often driven them away rather than showing compassion. We've made it like, oh, that's terrible. That's, I can't even touch that. Rather than say, well, that must be a real struggle. Or so you felt like this, you know, as soon as you felt sexual attraction, yeah. Or all the more should we have compassion. What happens is the activism is so ugly. We see what our kids are being taught in school. You see drag queens reading to toddlers. and so You see all this happening. You get so grieved on the inside that you then start pushing back against the people. No, the, the people need Jesus. We stand against the activism, but we preach the truth. And the truth is this, that those who practice sin, be it adultery, fornication, be it extortion, greed, be it homosexuality, those who practice sin will not inherit the kingdom. But Paul says, that's what some of you were. And all of us have testimony of the life-transforming power of the gospel. Wow. That was so good. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Brown. I have a just to let uh, I want to say to everyone on this call, please support Dr. Michael Brown's ministry. I visit AskDrBrown.org. You have an online school, right? Yes, we do. So yeah. if, uh, fireschoolofministry.com. Okay. We took all the classes we had taught. Some of them taught right in the fires of revival. We took all of our classes after 22 years of physical school, and we shut down the, the, the physical, put everything online, so you can just take one course, you can enroll in the entire program and, and take it, you know, at a slow pace or a full pace. So, you know, teaching on revival or teaching on Jewish roots or getting into the word or, uh, you know, teaching on giants of the faith. So all of our best classes there, it's full audio with complete study guides and then ministry practicums that people can act on. 
And then different faculty members get on different days with students to interact. So fireschooladministry.com and then the website where we have literally thousands of hours of free videos and articles. Ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org. And if you can stand with us in any way, that's awesome as well. Thank you, sir. And just one minute before you close us in prayer, what advice or encouragement do you have for us here in Canada or my friend in Nigeria? What advice do you have for us before you, you leave? God put you here in this generation and in this location for a purpose. Right. So this is the time to shine. The, how is history going to look back at this? When the books are open, how are they going to look back? Were we courageous? Were we people of faith? Were we people of fire? Did we get caught up with the carnality of the world? Did we get caught up with, with compromise and cowardice? Or out of our weakness, was God made strong? So this is the time to say, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me. And everything starts with personal relationship with God. So it's a constant thing for me in the midst of ministry. Step back and get with him recover the first love, reignite those flames so that Jesus is your all in all. First, with spend quality time with him, pour your life out with him, and then say, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me. Uh, the, the situation in Canada, in certain ways, is tougher than America because the, the believing church body is smaller and the culture is less of a combative culture, whereas Americans, we're going to fight for everything and be aggressive and stuff. But what you have to do is cross that line in your private life in prayer before God, where you are now free and you just obey him. And if preaching the gospel gets you in jail or preaching the gospel gets you a best-selling book contract, whatever, Lord, here I am, send me, use me. And then look, the, the, the love of God is irresistible. And as much as the, the media can demonize us and, and scandals can make us look bad, when you really love your neighbor, your neighbor's going to know that. When you take a real interest in that person that's hurting, they're going to know that. In the midst of COVID and the confusion of the day and so much pain, depression, fear, we have the answer. Let your light shine. Come on. Thank you, sir. Could you please close us in prayer, please? Yes, yes. That's so good. Thank you. Thank you. Father, even though it's, it's uh, from a distance that we're speaking, it feels like I'm in the same room with my friends. It feels closer to face to face. So I pray, Lord, as you're here right with us, touch, touch afresh, fresh fire, fresh desire for you, fresh hunger, fresh thirst. Lord, if we've left our first love, show us, convict us, may we repent and turn back. If we have become weighed down with ministry or busyness or family issues or just the, the challenges of life, I ask for something fresh to ignite within each of us, everyone watching this live, everyone who'll watch it in the days to come, May fire burn, the fire of passion for you. And out of that, may we see our own lives set ablaze to set ablaze the places in which we live for your glory with the fires of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you, sir. Thank God you, God bless sir. you, my brother. Great Thank getting you, to know God all bless of you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you.